again, my beauties and bees, we are here for another installment of Psy Fails where somebody fails science on the internet and I have to call them out on it. Um, so uh, today uh, we're, <laughs> we would, so I've been on a little bit of a binge lately with these, uh, these, these terrible anthropology takes um, from the Robert Suffer crowd. Sometimes I forget that there's other things that I need to be pointing out. Um, and that the video I just played there a minute ago, the Anthropocene. Anthropocene extinction event is a thing that's really happening. It's part of this horrid uh, uh, condition we're inflicting upon the, upon the planet that we share. Um, yeah, so there's facets to this stuff, though. Uh, so many facets. It goes so deep and people don't want to talk about it. But you know what? We're going to talk about it. Uh, we're going to talk about some climate change here. The end is near. What is found after the Euphrates dried up? Shocked scientist. Nature discovery. Let's see what this channel is all about. The Feast of the Tabernacle just happened. Oh my cave under the Euphrates has been sealed up, but this is what they found. This was two days ago. Oh, they, they have all kinds of uh, woo-woo videos. Look at that. They just, the, the discovery that shocked everyone. If, if a diver didn't capture this, no one would believe it. Uh, you got tsunamis. Tsunamis for my tsunami. Uh... Yeah, they so I mean you got Israel stuff, you've got uh, forbidden archaeology. It's it's a lot of uh, a lot of woo and nonsense, and they have uh, mixed in with with bad war takes as well. It looks like army of angels appears in the sky to grant victory for Israel. Holy shit! Look at that. This is the kind of stuff that these people uh, put out there. But today we're going to be looking at their in this nigh uh, video about the Euphrates drying up. We might watch the cave one too if we have time. We'll see what happens. Syria's longest river has receded, parching trees and leaving families of local farmers without water to drink. The mysterious drying of the Euphrates River perplexes scientists and communities living along its banks. Does it though? I'm pretty sure we know it's, you know, climate change, um, climate change bad. People who rely on it for survival are increasingly facing a dangerous situation. The dwindling water of the Euphrates has also sparked speculations about apocalyptic prophecies in the Bible. As water levels plummet, Geopolitical tensions are also likely to rise due to... What does Black Lives Matter have to do with the Euphrates drying up? Stop the hate in Black Lives Matter or the Euphrates. Which do you choose? <laughs> what is this? The true dichotomy here. Do we choose Biblical Apocalypse or Black Lives Matter, guys? What do we do? <laughs> due to the potential displacement of communities, oh. there is an urgent need to get to the root of the disappearing river. Is this a consequence of a climatic anomaly or a sign of the end time? Can it's not a climatic anomaly. It's a very predicted climatic event uh, called the Anthropocene um, extinction event <laughs> that I was just talking about a minute ago. Oh, what did I do that for? I didn't mean to do that. There we go. Can we reverse the impending water crisis? Join us as we unravel the mysteries. The Euphrates River is defying scientific understanding. The situation is dire in the Middle East, particularly in Iraq and Syria, where communities along the Euphrates banks traditionally rely on it for agriculture and other life endeavors have experienced a shocking decline, raising concerns about drought and potential consequences. Here, the liberal water before one year, two meters. Two meters? Yeah. That's about six feet high. Wow. And now this is just totally dead? However, this is not an isolated case. For instance, in Venice, Italy, 
Authorities are alarmed about deficient water levels that threaten the city's famed canals. Environmentalists have also expressed fear that the dwindling water supply may affect the traditional gondolas and disrupt the ecosystem. Similarly, in France, communities have experienced unusually long periods of drought, so the water crisis seems to be a global phenomenon. Yes, that's the way they write that. Uh, climate change is a global phenomenon, right? Um, it's, it's affecting everybody. We're all experiencing it. That's why we didn't have cold weather in, uh, in the upper Midwest. Like, really, like, we had mild weather until mid-January when we get suddenly drops down to, uh, to, to, 27 degrees below zero for three days and then snows for a couple weeks and that's going to be like in the 60s again next week so it's it's and it, it, this is the kind of stuff we do we get summers where it's hot blazing hot uh every every day uh in in august is a is a new record where i live every day for the last couple of years every year has been the hottest year on record what are you talking about yeah, obviously, it's a global phenomenon. This has generated a lot of fear because of biblical references to pervasive drafts towards the end of the world. However, some experts have blamed changing weather patterns triggered by climate change. Therefore, from a scientific some point experts, of view... The experts, the, the, the only real experts, the, none of the experts are saying, well, maybe this is a biblical event. That's not a thing that's happening. This is a normal environmental reaction to unsustainable practices. However, to people who prefer biblical meanings to scientific explanations, humanity might be witnessing our last days on Earth. It How doesn't matter if you prefer... If you prefer biblical prophecy. Uh, science is real, biblical prophecy is not. It's never panned out. So, um, it, if it, can someone name a, a biblical prediction? That, and that, this is the message that, they, that it's, I see someone mentioned. Uh, Lauren Bulbert uh, in the in the, the side chat there, Jason Jacoby did. Yeah, exactly. Um, she's the the type of person who's like, oh, this if the if this is happening, it's just biblical prophecy. It's just end times, and they want it to happen. True, could that be? What are the causes of the dwindling water levels? You already answered that. It's climate change. Rather than channel our energy on sensational claims, let us look at the underlying causes of these water shortages. It is essential claims. to state that the scientific world has been conducting a round-the-clock investigation into probable culprits for the dwindling water supply. Some believe that changes in precipitation patterns, unsustainable water management practices, mm -hmm. and global warming are crucial to understanding water drought. When it comes to the Euphrates Basin, it's uh, thousands of years of poor management, though. you got to understand that. And it's not their fault. They didn't. We, that's the Euphrates Basin. Is, the Tigris of the Euphrates is where we learned how to agriculture. So, yeah, we uh, it, it, it's like uh, your first drawing pad, right? <laughs> it's the, the valley is is wrecked. Um, but, yeah, there's increased damming for hydroelectric uh, that's that's causing that's causing the uh, the water shortage there is yeah definitely climate change the way that the water's being managed as well is a problem same thing with uh things in the western united states in some areas the way that the water is being managed this approach seems more objective to some people than doomsday predictions linking the water shortages to the impending destruction of the world dr pranjal kumar pukan a supply chain and operations management expert argues that by supporting research now there's there's canals and gondolas um, in uh, in cities along the Euphrates too stuff. Um, yeah, Venice is famous for its gondolas, but there's other other cities along Mediterranean cities and uh, cities along the rivers that have gondolas. Yeah, I don't I don't dig AI either, but I gotta address this message, Jason. Implementing sustainable water management strategies and promoting responsible use of resources, the world can navigate these challenges and build a more resilient future for all of humanity. Of particular concern is the fate of the Euphrates. Having served as the cradle of human civilization for millennia, experts now warn that the Euphrates face an uncertain future. The reason for this is simple. 
The once lively Euphrates River has dwindled into a shadow of its former glory. Some experts have painted a darker picture by claiming that the Euphrates could run dry by 2040, while some estimates place it much closer. Because the situation of the rich did not improve in 2023, millions of Iraqis and Syrians who rely on the river have been left in extreme distress. Right, because people are stealing their water upriver and uh, climate change is making it hard enough for farmers to grow crops and stuff right now. So you don't have to have a biblical, uh, it doesn't have to be a biblical event. The signs of the looming danger are everywhere. For instance, the volume of water flowing through the Euphrates has plummeted to nearly half its average during dry seasons. The iconic Euphrates Dam, once holding approximately 14 billion cubic meters of water, now holds approximately 10 billion cubic meters, a 75% loss that exposes the stark reality of rapid depletion. The drying of the Euphrates is not just a hydrological crisis. It is an existential crisis that has left scientists scrambling to map the shifting landscapes and chart the retreat path of the water. Poor settlements along the bank of the river continue to grapple with the economic and social fallout, while some people continue to express spiritual anxieties. I mean, the Mississippi is looking pretty, pretty icky and drained these days, too. It's, uh, it floods every now and then, though. Every few years it'll flood out. But yeah, for the most part, that's got a lot less volume than it used to. The latter set claims all these suggest the beginning of the fulfillment of ancient prophecies. Experts have also voiced concern that the consequences would be highly dire if the Euphrates ran dry, particularly in Iraq. Agriculture. Yeah, particularly for the people who live there. I don't disagree with you, friend. Um, yeah, that's, that's, the way, that's the way it goes. The region's lifeblood would halt, while livestock, another critical economic lifeline, would face similar devastation. Other industries dependent on water would also stop, affecting jobs, livelihoods, and production, and perpetuating poverty and mass displacement in those regions. The likelihood of disease outbreaks, civil unrest, and a surge of refugees fleeing to neighboring countries. I wonder what the soil is like in the, in the Euphrates Valley, because I would expect that it would be like really uh, have all the nitrogen just sucked out of it. We've been farming there for thousands of years. I don't think we've been farming anywhere as long as we've been farming in that river valley. Um, so, I mean, I'm not, and, I'm, and, and we, it used to be such a, the Middle East, there's a reason why it's the cradle of humankind. It used to be such a vibrant, lush place. Uh, that's where all, like, a lot of our um, Western crops come from. Uh, the, all the wheats and oats and all that come from that area, the Syria area. Um, the, the, there used to be a lot of animal diversity there too. There used to be like where the, the animals from three continents kind of came and met. There was ostriches and elephants and bears and tigers and cheetahs and lions and leopards and just all, all sorts, camels, all sorts of megafauna, all living together from three different continents, buffalo, uh, it was, it was uh, a melting pot. And then, of course, we flourish there as a species. And now, thousands of years later, it's, it's still, it's still suffering from the echoes of that uh, agricultural bloom where we learned how to grow food, where we learned how to, how to farm. At least in the old world, I know there was the, there's also Mesoamerica where they learned how to, um, how to farm in North America. That's, you know, corn and uh, squash and beans and stuff. You know. It's like Turkey and Iran adds another layer of complexity to the looming crisis. Geopolitical analysts believe that the drying up of the Euphrates could also trigger escalation in the Middle East and lead to devastating consequences. Imagine a scenario where the burden of a growing refugee I believe that. UG crisis pushes Iran to take a desperate measure, collaborating with Iraq to attack Turkish dams and unleash the water held there. While this action may help to alleviate internal pressure, it would trigger a wider regional conflict. Remember too that Turkey is a NATO member. As such, Turkey would instantly retaliate with the help of its allies. There is a legal obligation for the United States and other European NATO allies to defend Turkey, potentially escalating the conflict into a full-blown global war against Iran and Iraq. 
The implications of such a scenario are too bad to imagine. The immediate impact would be felt in the directly affected country. Well, there does need to be better uh, water management um, legislation. I, I definitely agree there. Yeah, to be fair, Mesoamericans Americans did rotation, rotating and slash and burn. Not probably not from the beginning though. I mean, they did crop rotation in in the uh, the mes uh, the yeah Meso what did you say Meso American and yeah in the uh, Mesopotamian region too. But they, after thousands of years of not doing it because they didn't know how. I mean, I don't know. I don't know. Everybody had to learn somewhere, right? There had, there had to be a testing ground. I don't know why uh, Mesoamerica is though, it's like a lot more tropical um, than I don't know though. I guess it's good. It's on the like the edge of where a desert where there's desert to the to the north and uh, and jungle to the south. It's kind of Mesoamerica, right? Now the Mesopotamia was pretty lush in of itself, and so it, it did have a desert to the it had a desert to the south, and then like more of a forested region to the north though in prehistoric times if i recall correctly with widespread destruction displacement and loss of life however the ripple effects would extend far beyond potentially destabilizing the entire region and impacting the global economy and supply chain therefore it is imperative to address the issues that could trigger this doomsday scenario by addressing the growing water crisis to address the drying up of the Euphrates River, scientists have argued for sustainable water resource management and implementing advanced yes. technologies such as satellite monitoring and hydrological yes. modeling to enhance real-time data collection for informed decision-making. Additionally, some experts have recommended reforestation in the watershed of the river to aid... Exactly, to aid uh, yeah, in, in maintaining the banks and decreasing erosion... ...in natural water retention and prevent excessive runoff. Constructing efficient water storage infrastructure. That's what I was saying about man, just the whole man, the whole system can be overhauled. We can fix this. Um, there's a lot of. Well, I mean, we can't fix climate change in one day, but we can. We can fix river systems, right? We can. We can. River systems require. Uh, sorry, but they require uh, trees on the bank to hold the hold the bank together. That's that's how that works. Otherwise, you just get continuous uh, erosion, and uh, if it gets rapine, it's gonna get it's gonna go everywhere, right? And the banks won't hold it. Um, we need to, yeah, we need to do better water management in general, but uh, definitely planting uh, planting more uh, planting more uh, trees and doing more wetland re reservoirs as opposed to lake reservoirs will be good. Wetlands uh, help to uh, filter the nutrients out of the water and add nutrients into the water from, yeah, it's like a tea. Sure. And regulating ecology. dam operations has also been put forward to mitigate the impact of droughts. Collaborative efforts among riparian countries for equitable water sharing agreements, combined with community-based water conservation initiatives, can contribute to a collective approach. What do the scriptures say about the Euphrates? The receding waters of the Euphrates River also depict the mystery of the angel depicted in the book of Revelation. Witnessing the blare of the sixth angel, St. John heard a voice emanating from the golden altar. The guardian angel identified this voice as that of the Lord, and it commands the angel with the trumpet to unleash the four angels bound at the Euphrates. These avenging figures emerge from the river with weapons, ready to carry... So there's going to be angels coming out of the river, y'all carry out their mission, which is to kill a third of humanity. The Bible also observes the dryness of the riverbed, leaving many to wonder whether all these have started to unfold. The beings were described as demons, fallen angels confined and bound in eternal darkness. That is not all. In sharp contrast to these demons, the angels of God roam freely, although many angels of darkness are left roaming. Ephesians 6.12 reminds us that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the principalities, against the powers, against the world rulers of this. Hold on, we gotta get Kenneth Copeland to say that. Let me see if I can find him saying that. Because he says it best. Let 
Russell. There we go. Does it just have that as a short? Yeah, we're going to watch Isn't that. it true that you want to fly? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because this is commercial so that you can fly in luxury how much money did you pay for tyler perry's gulfstream jet for example well for example that's really none of your business but isn't it the business of your donors listen i paid <laughs> the airplane that we have that i bought from tyler perry and i didn't pay anywhere and tyler's one of the greatest guys he made it he made that airplane so cheap for me i couldn't help but buy it I love your eyes. Again, getting back to the comment, you said that you don't like to fly commercial because you don't want to get into a tube with a bunch of demons. Do you really believe that human beings are demons? No, I do not. And don't you ever say I did. We wrestle not with flesh and blood, but principalities and powers. Isn't it true that you want to fly commercial so that you can... Sorry, I just had to... I had to play that. Anytime, every, anytime I see this quote from the Bible, I have to play that now. Darkness against the spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. It is also it's important to note that the Euphrates region, where these four angels are bound, has a significant connection to the fall of man's sin. Some scholars believe that the God... Uh, yeah, Copeland, he, he shapeshifts, right? Rah! He's suddenly very scary. All, like He can be... like His face shifts to this creepy smiling kind of clownish face to like he, he would have been an excellent to play like Pennywise, right? <laughs> Garden of Eden is nearby this river and some believe the first murder occurred in its fertile plains Genesis 4 8 the first recorded war erupted there Genesis 14 and Nimrod's kingdom known for no 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 there were wars we have records of wars from way before anything in the Bible we have like the remains of wars we have battlefields of, we have a lot of pre-biblical battlefields. Um, we have a lot of, uh, I think we actually have like uh, some, some, uh, some Paleolithic battlefields. We have some like, like from the Pleistocene, the way, way back before the Bible, like thousands of years before the Bible uh, of, of warring uh, groups of uh, people being massacred with uh, arrow holes in their bodies or arrows stuck in their bodies and buried in mass graves. We have that. We have records of that. <laughs> For its Babylonian idolatry rose in the same area, Genesis 10. Zechariah 5 and Revelation 18. Why is Babylonian belief systems, uh, why are they, what do you say? in the same area genesis 10 known for its babylonian idolatry, idolatry rose in the same area yeah. genesis 10 because a different religion is idolatry i guess zechariah 5 and revelation 18 depict that future judgment awaits this region although interpretations of these facts are diverse some people see the four bound angels as symbolic forces representing spiritual upheaval or destructive powers unleashed during the end times acting as instruments of god's wrath Others view them as fallen angels or demonic entities tied to the Euphrates region and gradually released to wreak havoc and chaos by reducing water availability. Others believe the four angels are historical figures or powers, like military leaders or nations from the Euphrates region. This connects... They were probably represented the uh, nations around Israel at the time, I believe is the, uh, is the idea. Um... With the four, the, the, the four nations that are uh, tied to the Euphrates Valley around, uh, around Israel. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. I'm not a biblical scholar, but... ...them to specific geopolitical events or conflicts. According to this view, God planned significant destruction for the Roman Empire, which persecuted the early church. He intentionally delayed this destruction to ensure the protection of his people. But even after the devastation caused by the release of the angels, Revelation 9 tells us the wicked still refuse to learn or change. If the four angels are indeed bound beneath... And Rome isn't even around anymore. So he just, I guess he, uh, the Roman Empire held the uh, nation of Israel hostage. So God couldn't do anything. That's crazy that you can hold, as you can hold a nation hostage and get God and bend God to your will. Like, 
wow uh, are we doing that now are we can we um, are we holding israel hostage beneath the surface of the euphrates oh yeah they're gonna show Zelensky. they're gonna be all kinds of weird yeah uh, in which is super weird because is ukraine doesn't even isn't even close to the euphrates valley is it it is only a matter of time before they are fully unleashed on humanity. Imagine a land bounded by the mighty Tigris, Euphrates, and Jordan rivers. This ancient oasis known as the Fertile Crescent was not just the largest in the Middle Eastern region, it is widely accepted as the cradle of civilization. Scientists of Western civilization. Yeah? And we got Mesoamerica on the other side of the uh, other side of the Atlantic recently discovered evidence that life once thrived under the water of the Euphrates. It was here, along the banks of the Euphrates, that the Sumerian civilization was born. According to Amanda Onion of the History Channel, the Sumerians built a great civilization in the shadow of the Tigris and Euphrates around 3800 BC. The city was called Mesopotamia. Other city-states like Eridu, Nippur, Lagash, Kish, Ur, and the Grand Uruk were marvels of their time. At its peak, Uruk boasted a population of between 40,000 and 88,000, making it one of the most populated cities in the ancient world. Yeah. The Sumerians laid the foundation for the advancements that shaped the- and we, and we supported all of these societies and all these cities and cultures along these rivers for thousands of years, and now we're kind of reaping the consequences of that. We didn't- uh, and, and yeah, supporting that big of, a, of, a, of an economy is going to be difficult. So it makes sense, but that, that they're going to have to uh, really strip the resources from the land to, to sustain themselves. And learning how to do crop rotation for uh, 88,000 people is pretty, uh, pretty difficult. <laughs> I'm doing it in a pinch. And we have civilizations just as old on the Nile and Yangtze and Ganges River. Yep. Mm -hmm. The course of humanity. For instance, with their cuneiform script, they invented writing and carving knowledge onto clay tablets. They also designed complex irrigation systems, leveraging the rivers to cultivate abundant crops. They also adopted the. And, uh, also, I uh, just the Mino, my, my Noans too. We had, uh, they were they were doing stuff at this at this time as well. First codified legal system called the Code of Hammurabi, laying the groundwork for justice and order. Sadly, by 1940 BC, the Elamites had ravaged and looted the Sumerian city-states. The Babylonians unified Mesopotamia and ended Sumerian independence. By 1700 BC the identity of the Sumerians had gradually crumbled. Yet the Euphrates River holds secrets that we have yet to see. So far, archaeologists have found evidence of their pioneering efforts in writing, astronomy, mathematics, geometry, and even medicine. We would have loved to see better aquaculture from them though, right? With like better maintenance of their, of their uh, waterways. Remarkably, we still rely on their ingenious multiplication tables, area and circumference calculations, and surgical techniques like craniotomy. Beyond peaceful scientific pursuits, the Sumerians also excelled in the art of war. That was not... I think it was, uh, uh, yeah, according to Amanda Onion, um, I think that that was a man to Onion. Not all. Their arsenal included formidable spears, bronze helmets, and sturdy shields woven from leather or wicker, including combat chariots and carts. It is also important to note that the biblically promised land is around this river. Canaan has been described as a land where mountains meet valleys and ancient rivers carve their paths. Scholars have observed a profound relationship between geography and religion in this region. It is a land where right? faith was tested. Because most of the religious texts are also property rights uh, and uh, laws and everything like that. So, yeah, it's going to tell you how the land is divided up between the, you know, the sons of, uh, what is it? the sons of Noah is how the, I believe the Israelites did it, right? Just things like that. ...and refined when God told Abraham to leave his father's house far on the other side of the Euphrates to Canaan land. Some believe its sacredness is reflected in the title bestowed upon it, the Promised Land. 
However, the path of righteousness is not always smooth. Over time, the inhabitants of Canaan, even the once devout people of Jerusalem, strayed from their spiritual obligations. Greed and wickedness took root, displacing the purity that- Ooh, did you just- so we got, uh, uh greedy Jew imagery. Weird. From an evangelical. Hmm. Once defined their lives. Prophets like Jeremiah were chosen by God as voices crying out against the rising tide of iniquity and warning of impending consequences if the hearts of the Israelites remained unrepentant. Apart from Canaan land, Great Babylon is another important kingdom that survived around the Euphrates. Babylon stood tall across the vast Mesopotamian plains, evidence of the power of human imagination and ambition. So it's funny, but like God got so mad about the Tower of Babel because like, oh, this building's too tall. And then we got like, even in the Middle East, they got buildings that are like orders of magnitude bigger than anything that was built in the ancient world. And we got like stuff in space now. Why is God not mad anymore? Why is he, God is a super good realtor. He sure knows how to pick lands that's not, you know, already occupied. Yeah. Yeah, by other groups of, because uh, uh, the Israelites, they were they were Canaanite people as well. They were all part of the same people group. They're just like, ah, those other Canaanites, they're in our, that, that's the land God gave to us, not to them. We can go kill them and take it. Babylon was planted by the... Yeah, I mean, it's subtle, Ring. Uh, gotta love the unique brand of evangelical anti-Semitism. Yeah, it's like, maybe the people of... of uh, Israel became greedy and it shows someone stuffing dollar bills into their purse. It's yeah. mighty Euphrates <laughs> with the city's walls built to impregnable standards. The rulers of the city are described as confident. Yet even empires seemingly built to last are not immune to the passage of time and the changing hands of fortune. The prophet Jeremiah's prophecies extended beyond Canaan's borders, reaching the ears of the Babylonian elite. He spoke of a day when the seemingly invincible city would fall, its defenses would be breached, and its streets would cry and wail in defeat. What does this have to do with the water shortage? Can you get to the water shortage, please? His warnings were usually met with scorn. You wouldn't believe what happened next. Not only did Babylon fall, but the great Euphrates by which the city thrived is drying off today. Nothing lasts forever. So wait, this is the continuation of the curse on Babylon? for enslaving the, he the the Hebrew people? Is that is that the direction we're going? Lake Gontan's water level is drastically limiting how many ships can pass through the Panama Canal right now. Yeah, it's, it's a global issue, definitely. So much nonsense. Historians have always been fascinated by the ingenuity of all major civilizations and kingdoms that lived by the Euphrates. For instance, King Cyrus of Persia was driven by strategic thinking and designed an unprecedented engineering feat. He diverted the flow of the Euphrates River, transforming the once formidable watery barrier into a dry path that his army rode to conquest. Under the cloak of a festive night, the Persians infiltrated the great city, claiming victory without a single bloodshed. King Belshazzar was captured and executed, and the city would remain buried until the early 19th century. Babylon, the seemingly impregnable fortress, crumbled. This. So, uh, I, I just I, the, so the Persians conquering Babylon is that what we're is that where we are now? I'm kind of lost on the narrative here. This once again shows the impermanence of powerful empires. Centuries later, the once bustling city lay abandoned, swallowed by the sands of time. I mean, that is pretty brilliant to block the river so you can just walk across because the river uh, is what's allowing them to, as long as it wasn't like mud on the bottom. Time. Its ruins are silent witnesses to a forgotten era and a manifestation of the prophecies of the prophet Jeremiah. The Euphrates now mirrors the downfall of all the major cities and civilizations built around it. Although modern archaeology has breathed new life into the story of Babylon and the Euphrates, as layers of sand are peeled away, past secrets come to light. And it's just super cool, but doesn't mean that, uh, that the, where the drought is caused by biblical prophecy. Underwater villages emerge from the riverbed, and the more they dig, the more questions they find than answers. For instance, 
Some have argued that we may not understand the historical topography of the Euphrates River. Questions remain. Is the current level of the Euphrates its true state, or is it slowly returning to its original course, a silent testament to the cyclical nature of time? What do you think? It's caused by climate change. No, it's caused by, caused by climate change. Shop smart, shop ass smart. Did I get a um, Army of Darkness reference? Perhaps the Euphrates is not declining like we are made to believe. Perhaps it is reverting to its historical status. We can never absolutely- What do you mean reverting to its historical status? They used to have uh, lush forests along the banks all the way down. Miles on either side. That's why we settled it. It was lush and things would grow there. It wasn't a desert, it's a desert now. Absolutely tell. The simple truth is, that the mysteries surrounding the Euphrates and its connection to ancient civilizations and prophecies continue to intrigue scholars and explorers alike. Is Euphrates linked to the second coming of Christ? On the continual dwindling of the Euphrates River. Christ is a, uh, about 2,000 years late for his appointment, so I don't think he's coming. I don't think he wants the job. I think he's like... Uh, yeah, thank you for the free tri trial of Libyan with humans. Uh, I'm done. Thank you. And he left. He left. <laughs> it is impossible to stay on the fence. As noted earlier, some view it as a natural cycle linked to climate change and environmental... It's not some. That's who... That The, the experts... That, that's the experts. That's the people who study this for a living. ...concerns, while others see it as a prophetic echo of the end of the world and the second coming of Christ. What was with the car accident? That's so weird. Let us recall that the river marked the boundaries of the promised land, the land God called Abraham to claim thousands of years ago. It witnessed the rise and fall of empires and civilizations. Prophets proclaimed it, and many pilgrims have tread its banks. The current decline of the river begs the question, are we in the twilight of the return of Christ? Let us recall the words of Christ. Jesus warned of signs in the heavens and on the earth. That would mark his second coming. But speculating in this regard is... This is not natural stuff happening, though. These aren't signs of the apocalypse. This is anthropo uh, anthropocentric climate change. We're causing this with industrialization. Uh, it has nothing to do with the Bible. Just stop. We need to, we need to worry about uh, carbon. And uh, when it comes to the water cycle, we need to worry about getting water to uh, these people in these poor nations instead of saying, oh, no, but just, just Jesus is coming back. Don't worry about it. Uh, your kids are going to are going to you know, starve here, but you know what? Jesus will be around any second. It's difficult. Remember that Jesus also said no one knows the hour and it will come like a thief in the night. So we might keep living each day with anxious presumptions. The dwindling of the Euphrates, whether a natural environmental phenomenon or a matter of spiritual significance, should not be anxiety within us, but courage. It is a No, we should have anxiety about this and be working to fix this because no, we can't be like, oh, you know, we don't, it's just the, the Bible says this is going to happen. There's nothing we can do about it instead of doing something about it. Reminder that each decision and choice will finally be subjected to the judgment of Christ someday. Let us then move forward, Christ undeterred by shadows, to my knowing that our big... He's going to be subject to my judgment about like, hey, you know, there's, these rivers are drying up and stuff. You got magic powers. Why don't you fix this? Big and small efforts are meaningful beyond these fleeting days. Whether the Euphrates holds secrets of the Garden of Eden and the impending rapture of the saints, one thing remains clear. Faith is our anchor, not the ebb and flow of rivers. In this uncertain time, let it guide us, steady and robust, as we await the day, whenever it may dawn. Does your instinct follow the scientific explanation of climate change and sustainability? Or do you believe in the deeper revelations of the scriptures? Why Drop is that the deeper revelations? Your opinion in the comments section. Oh, for Pete's sakes. Yeah, so that was, uh, again, this is, their channel is called Nature Discoveries, and it has a picture of the, of the earth and everything, but if you actually go in and look, it's not about nature at all. It's about biblical stuff. So, don't be fooled. There's angels on the battlefield in uh, Israel, remember that. Uh, there is...
underwater volcano suddenly cracking open in the West Coast, it looks like. Pope Francis just revealed the Antichrist has arrived. Uh, supernova explosion will take over in the night sky. Oh, wow. Satan is coming. So, yeah, this is, to give you an idea what kind of channel we're dealing with here. Um, and this is the kind of shit that I like to shed light on. So, I hope you really enjoyed this uh, this little dive. I, I get, I get to uh, cussing when people are ignoring things like climate change for biblical prophecy. It annoys me. It makes me mad. I don't like for uh, people to have a, uh, a get out of jail free card to say, you know what, I uh, I think this is biblical, so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna do anything to change it. I think this is what's supposed to happen because the Bible tells me so. So I'm not gonna do anything to fix these uh, these ecology problems, these agricultural issues. I'm not gonna do anything to fix the climate. Um, I'm not going to do anything to reduce the, the use of fossil fuels because this was what the, Jesus put those here for us to use. And if we were, and he, if, if these are signs that he's coming back. It's just, it's just gross excuses. It's just excuses. Anyway. Yeah. So what do you think? Uh, same, same question posed to my audience. If, do, do you believe in uh, an anthropocentric climate change causing these issues? Or do you think that this is end time prophecy? Um, tell me in the comments down below. Uh, please remember to be kind, take care, and we will see you next time. I heard the Lord say this on December 9th. He explained the mother of the homeland phrase. He said, this is the homeland. It's here. It's the United States. He's talking about the United States. He said, it's someone who is going to take this country in hand the way a mother would. Someone who is going to take charge of freedom and seeing that it happens the way she wants it to. Now, the Lord asked me to address the she language. I believe he's, he's using this mother of the homeland. Metaphorically speaking, he's not necessarily saying that he's talking about a female, though. He, he could be. I don't know. But he also said moth man, you know, in the original word. So I think it could go either way. Then I heard later mother A. And when I went to type it down, autocorrect changed it. And it changed it to Mothra, which is a big giant moth. Uh, creature from the Godzilla movies, you know, those old stories and movies and stuff. And I was going to change it. And then the Holy Spirit told me not to like, he, th that's what he said to me to get me to write down Mothra. Maybe he knew I wouldn't write it down, you know, if, if he said it straight up. But then as soon as I saw a Mothra written, written down, uh, I heard the Lord say this, a giant among the land yet stowed away for a time in a capsule. It's kind of similar to what the Mothra creature in, in those stories was a giant among the land yet stowed away for a time in a capsule waiting to hatch, waiting to show up in strength having to take down a giant lizard to reach its goal. So this is obviously a metaphor, okay? Obviously a metaphor, but also, you know, in this story, I went and I looked it up, Wikipedia says about Mothra, unlike other Toho monsters, Mothra is a largely heroic character, having been variously portrayed as a protector of her own island culture. So I did not know that when I heard this word, but I went and looked it up and it agrees with this word that I'm hearing, that this is gonna be a mother-like figure interested in protecting its homeland, protecting its people. So who is God talking about here? So a couple quick notes I need to say before I finish. And number one is answering this question, is the Lord talking about 2024? He did not specifically say 2024 in this word. I would assume that is what he's talking about since that's what we're leading up to. Yet, I'm gonna say it in that context. I didn't hear 2024, that's an assumption of mine. So please take that in mind. The other thing is this word actually seems to connect very specifically with one of the candidates. I'm not gonna say who that is, why? Because God did not ask me to make that connection. But just doing a little Googling for yourself, you may be able to find what it is I'm talking about. But there's a very specific connecting point to one of the current candidates. That's all I'm gonna say there, is that that may be the person he's talking about. It may not. He didn't specifically say who it was.